Hi everyone, bonsoir, and welcome back to another episode of the podcast. So today we have a very special guest, and if you're into GEA, if you're into all things Gaelic football, you're going to absolutely love this one. So I'll start by saying over the last 10 years, I've had pretty much every job that you can possibly have to do with a senior Gaelic football team. I've done the jerseys, I've done the water bottles, I've gathered the cones, I've been the manager, I've been the trainer, I've been the stats man, I've been the video analysis guy, and I've been the strength and conditioning coach. So I've had all those jobs to do with senior teams. But primarily, what I consider myself is a fan. I'm a Gaelic football fan. I absolutely love the game. And if there's one team that has been the best team that I've ever seen play the game, it's the Carfin team that we're going to talk about in this podcast. They are the greatest team of all time. I never use that phrase, the GOAT. I think it's a stupid phrase and it's used way too often. But when you're talking about Lee Keegan for Mayo, Messi for Argentina, or club teams, Kerfin are the greatest team I've ever seen playing. So as a fan, that's my opinion. And just to reaffirm the fact that no one from Kerfin is going around saying we were the best ever. I don't think it's in their nature and it's definitely not in Giz's nature. So what do we talk about in today's podcast? We talk about how he started playing Gaelic football, his roots, what are things like in Kerfin, the famous way that they coach players, very, very simple stuff, but very, very interesting at the same time how they're encouraged, how certain attributes or certain habits are promoted, which is really, really important. If you're a coach, if you're involved in GA, if you're dealing with kids, teenagers or adult players, how do you encourage certain habits that this particular Kerfin team had in abundance? You know, selflessness, hard work, courage, physical toughness, bags of skill, all those things that make up a brilliant team in any sport. How do they encourage them in Kerfin? Because they got it right. They were the best team ever. They won three All-Ireland titles in a row. They have all of the accolades that come with a statement like, who is the best team ever? We talk about how he views success because as many people listening to this podcast will be able to relate, if you just won one intermediate title, one senior title, you'd be absolutely thrilled. You'd be over the moon. We're talking about dozens and dozens of medals from... Connacht titles, All-Ireland titles, Galway senior titles. How do you look at success a little bit differently when you're achieving it so often? How do you relate that back? How do you stay grounded despite winning so many games? We talk about what his opinion is on what young players should be focusing on, what they should be concentrating on because you, know, you can only divide up your time and focus on a narrow amount of things and a lot of people focus on the wrong things i've seen this as a ga coach and as a gym owner over and over again people focus on the wrong things they spend a lot of time and energy on things that just don't matter so what's his opinion on the few things you should be focusing on as a young footballer to achieve your potential we talk about how and why and when he started lifting weights he put on about 5 to 10 kg of muscle and became a far better Gaelic footballer. We talk about exactly what he went through in that process. So what foods did he eat? What exercises did he do? Who wrote the program? What type of program it is? That type of stuff that a lot of people find fascinating. It's what I would listen to and talk about all day long. So if you do need to bulk up, if you do need to get stronger, fitter, leaner, he worked under a lot of the top, top strength and conditioning coaches in the country, what they told him and how he achieved his physical goals outside of the sport. We talk about the nuts and bolts of how the Carfin machine worked. I can tell you from running a business and being manager of a GA team, you're going to have a clash of personalities. It's pretty much guaranteed. And people might assume, well, if you have big personalities, you're gonna clash more. But I have found through my reading, through my experience, that's the exact opposite. I think the bigger the personality, the more confident they are in their own ability, the less likely they are to be an egomaniac and step on other people's toes. You had the top coaches, some of the top coaches in Galway, in the country, you had brilliant physios, strength and conditioning staff, you had a manager or a couple of managers in the period we're talking about. How did they organize that so that they all got along well, they all know how to do their job, and they all had the freedom to do their jobs to the best of their ability. I know if you're a Gaelic football manager, you'll find that bit so, so important. It's so, so difficult to get stats men, physio, strength and conditioning staff, 
selectors, all these people singing off the same hymn sheet. It's, it's a beautiful thing when it happens, but it's hard to get going, it's hard to keep going, and it's very easy to fall off. So we talk about how Kerr Finn managed to do that, particularly in the era where they won the three All-Ireland titles in a row. We talk specifically about some of the most fascinating games that I saw Kerr Finn play in that period. So again, I can say as a fan of football, I'm pretty sure I watched Kerr Finn in this era as closely as anyone excluding people from the actual club themselves. I was at an awful lot of games. I watched so much video. I was really, really interested and fascinated in everything that they were doing. So I pick apart a few games that I was particularly interested in as an outsider, as a fan looking in from the sidelines, and I ask questions about that. So I think any fan of Gaelic football will appreciate that particular part of the podcast because you get an inside look on what happens in a top class setup in a high pressure situation. So without any further ado, his name is Kieran McGrath, but most people will call him Giz. This is a wide ranging and very interesting conversation on all things GEA, physical training and strength and conditioning. I hope you enjoy it and as usual don't forget to like the episodes, subscribe and follow me on all social media platforms and there on them all, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, even TikTok. Thanks again for listening, merci. So today I'm having a very special guest, it's not the first time we've talked about football, won't be the first time we've uh, argued about football either, uh, Kieran McGrath from Curfin. We're going to talk mainly football and fitness today which We've talked about it hundreds of times in the past. So first of all, to start with, uh, did you have a coffee to start the day? Uh, how are you, Kev? Um, thanks for having me. Yeah, sure. Morning ritual, like most others, uh, got up, got the kids out the door and sat down and had a coffee then just to relax for a few minutes. And would you have the coffee before you eat your breakfast normally? Um, probably the, the, the last while, if you're at home, probably maybe have something to eat first, maybe just even a small bit of porridge or slice the toast and then have the coffee. And have you always, is that more of a recent thing or later in your football career where you'd be more conscious of what you were eating and putting in your body? Or were you always that way? Uh, I think, I'd say it's more around the football. Um, I suppose from a nutrition point, when in, as I got older and went in with an inter-county panel, um, around the 2011-2012 mark, it, nutrition was big. Uh, nutritionists were available at the at, in the squad in Galway. So, um, like everyone else, I sat down, and listened to their advice, and tried to put it into practice. I suppose so. Them habits now have carried on for the last ten or eleven years. Uh, there's a couple of kids in the mix, in so it's not as easy as it was. You you have more people to worry about than yourself. So, yes. um, the easiest thing maybe first thing in the morning is uh, just have a slice of toast with the kids. Uh, not ideal, but uh, you do what you have to do too. Yes, yes, yes. And would you, like one of the first things I do when I go in with a GA team, or I have done, is change the diet. Because if they change the diet, they get far more out of the training you do with them, whether that's weight training or fitness training. Did you find a uh, difference in your performance when you did start focusing a little bit more on diet or did you find it more essential as you got older and you got away with more as you were younger or um i suppose i'm coming from a, a different era kev where yes diet wasn't a big thing uh you trained hard you played hard uh there wasn't too much talk on nutrition or strength and conditioning or, or anything else like that but uh from my point of view going in with galway uh look like you could identify easy enough that it was a step up in standards so you had to do something different you couldn't you couldn't do the same things as you were doing at club level and expect to compete at inter-county level uh, and I suppose it took me that first year when I went in with Galway to realise that that uh, okay you could do certain things at a lower level and get away with it but to be to be competitive at that uh, the top end so you're playing division one football and at the time Mark and Dan Hughes from down and these type of players who were serious athletes uh, you needed to be strong and you needed to be at your peak condition really 
your footballing ability wasn't enough. So I think my first year when I went in, um, yeah, I listened to the nutritionist, try to improve it. But then uh, I realised, and it took me that year, that I need to do more and get better. So I really worked hard on it uh, and then went to the nutritionist myself outside on the off season when we had finished and looked to really improve it and lay down and obviously then it, it had it had advantages uh, and it worked for me mm. and then the bias of course gave if it works um if it works you want to keep doing it and you you try to promote it others. and what was the main thing they taught you and how old were you at that stage probably 26 26 27 so it was late yeah uh like anyone kev uh i'd imagine what did my day consist of before that was probably get up go to work do a few things before you eat uh you, like if you're up at seven you mightn't start eating till 10 or 11 and then at that stage it's a cup of tea and a slice of toast yeah if you like the toast you'd have half a loaf uh <laughs> yeah bowl of cornflakes uh yeah. Whatever it was, your bowl of cereal, and you thought that was enough because you you felt full after it. Well, um, you also thought it was enough because you had got to a quite a high level doing that. Yeah, and then, then of course, uh, like others, you'd have your breakfast roll maybe at times, or your your full Irish if you were lucky enough to eat out or whatever it may be. So um, that that's kind of where I was at for a long time, and then I realised. That wasn't going to be good enough anymore, and I had to something had to change. Mm. Uh, and it was the change was more around uh, wanting to play into a county football. The change wasn't uh, around lifestyle, or I wanted to get or improve my diet overall. It was based around football performance uh, and performance. Yeah, I wanted to I wanted to give myself the best chance uh, to perform at the highest level. So uh, then. Why not? Uh, if a nutritionist is there, my attitude before that was, well, this is football. Can he or she teach me anything to get better at football? I, your mindset is probably, oh, probably not. But uh, my attitude changed. Well, let's give it a go. If you, if you can't beat them, join them. Mm. And let's do what he or she tells me to do for six to 12 months and see if it improve. And for me, it did improve. Okay. You know? and now, what, what was the main thing they taught you? about diet because there's like you could do many many different uh, college courses about nutrition and being a dietitian and all these different things but the best way or the most practical way to learn most things not everything but most things is by actually living it yourself and tweaking with your diet and seeing what works and seeing what doesn't or tweaking with your gym program tweaking with your business and seeing what works in the real world and what doesn't what did you tweak that worked for you day-to-day day. I suppose like everything else Kev uh, I just did what I was told so I didn't actually really think about it too much or uh, looking back what changed um, it's hard to know it's just that I probably started eating more uh, started eating more and then eating better foods like the nutritionist might say okay so change out your your toast your white bread change it to rye bread or whatever it may be uh, homemade brown bread mm. uh, so like it was practical it wasn't a case that well scrap everything you were doing and get rid of it it was exactly. a case of well Small replace things. yeah can we replace the white toast with with homemade brown bread that would have been the first um, can we replace the cereal with porridge uh, can we add fruit and nuts to your porridge and that kind of stuff so I just did all that uh, as I went along not really knowing why I was doing it yes. not knowing the benefits of eating porridge, say with regards to carbohydrates, uh, the benefits of eating eggs for your proteins and later on adding avocado and stuff for your fats or whatever maybe. I didn't think about that. That I was just doing what mm. I was told and similar with the SNC programs. I mean, you were given a gym program and you just did it. You mm. didn't think about why you were doing it or what the benefits was. But then as you get older and... You, you start to ask why. You start to ask the why, yeah. Mm. So. Okay, and... And now that you've moved into a little bit more coaching, you're still playing, but a little bit more coaching, definitely for me as a coach as well. Do you feel how the way I do is in like so many players leave so much of their potential behind them just by not being that physically in better shape? You know, like they have this 
natural power or natural uh, athleticism. They're just too out of shape to express it fully. Yeah, um, definitely. And like even from my own point of view, uh, like uh, could I have been better when I was younger? And should the answer was, the answer is, yeah, definitely. Because we didn't know what we didn't know. Um, we didn't understand nutrition. We didn't understand S&C. And that's not down to anyone else. It wasn't big at the time. It wasn't that people were trying to force it on us. Mm. It just it and from a curve point of view, like my corner led the way really with uh S and C and even nutrition and he tried he tried to incorporate that as best he could. But I suppose it was hard for him because he was playing with us. Uh so it was hard for him to come to me and say, Look at you need to be eating this or you need to be eating that. But he did try and encourage uh, and I suppose he set good examples in like it was obvious the condition he was in and mm. the levels he was achieving that whatever he was doing was working. So if you copped on and followed what he was doing, yes, uh, you would reach a higher potential. Which is essentially what you're trying to get any team to do is get a few of the leaders to um, act a certain way or behave a certain way and everyone else just to uh, take that upon themselves to start doing something similar whether they know why or not yeah and and that's from my point of view that's where i was at where i was playing a lot of sport um wasn't too bad i suppose at, at the sports i played uh but like i didn't concentrate on on nutrition didn't concentrate on snc or any of that type of stuff but i looked at fitzy and mike homer damien burke gary size and these were performing at high high level um and what i noticed with them okay maybe they'd come back for a, a club game and you know your dim club games maybe gary delaney and joe kenny and these lads that weren't at the high level that that fitzy and mike homer they'd end up being the better players in the club game so then it kind of didn't make sense mm. that these lads were putting in so much work and doing all this stuff but our better players maybe on the day might have been the the guys that weren't at this but as we went up in level, you could really identify it. So then when we went to an All-Ireland semi-final and you played Kilmacud and St. Colts, our standout players, and the, the guys that were able to compete the best was your Mike Comers, Kieran Fitzgerald, uh, Sicey, Damien Burke, Ellen Burke. Um, so then something tweaked that, well, hold on, that, oh, okay, whatever it is, what these lads are at, the higher level you go, mm. you see the real benefits out with you know pace mm. power uh strength all that kind of stuff so that opened my eyes a bit that it made me realize okay that uh the long-term benefits or the benefits that came out of doing what these guys were doing was when we met better oppositions and you were able to compete yes uh so so really for from the current film point of view fitzy and 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 mike home and these lads led the way and you could follow suit they didn't force anyone to do it their way um, well, it but, doesn't work, does it, if you try and force people to do it? Yeah, so uh, they never forced anyone or never said, look, we need to do this, this and this. They just did what they did. And I suppose if you wanted to follow suit, it would improve you. And I did in the end up, and I suppose it did improve me as well then. Mm -hmm. But I, I've i noticed, say if you have these fellas who are leading the way in terms of like physical condition or preparation and things like that, if the management is... Uh, pointing them out as you know, being the leaders of the pack or putting them in the leadership roles, marking the hardest players or always starting, getting the most game time or captaincy, there will be an edge in the pan then, oh, I need to start doing more of what he's doing. Whether if a management, which uh, often happens, doesn't point out the hardest workers on the team, uh, the habits that are really good and should be reinforced aren't reinforced the way they should be. Yeah, so for us in Curfin, that probably was the case. Looking back when you're when you're talking about it there, that like when Stephen Rotter came in, um, it was a blank canvas. So, uh, maybe before that, lads would have seen that they had their place on the team, or you know they were regular they were there a long time they might have been connected to someone whatever it may be they might have had to work that hard or do uh they were there a reputation for argument's sake but when when Roch came in to as an open 
blank canvas. So then obviously whoever worked the hardest, whoever was playing well at the time, whoever was putting in the work, mm. uh, was getting their place. So then that obviously built a, a culture and environment that, well, hold on. Uh, and we've been regularly testing the stuff. Well, if, if, if I do all these things, I'm going to get a chance here. But if I don't do these things, yes. if, and it doesn't guarantee you, uh, just because you do all the right things, doesn't mean it guarantees you your place. But what it definitely did was that uh, if you weren't doing these things, you, you definitely weren't going to be playing. So, yes. uh, yeah, that's that probably what happened when Roch came in, mm. culture was built and most fans got on board. Mm. It's funny when I remember you saying to me one time, this was before you'd won any All-Ireland, that uh, Kerr Finn were slow to use Mike Comer and that he had been around as a good strength and conditioning coach before he started utilizing utilize them. But Kerr Finn still would have been leading the way in strength conditioning, nutrition, tactics, so many of these things. But still, even then, you'd feel like you could have used them a bit sooner. I think a lot of clubs struggle with that. They have good people around them, but they're not utilizing them. Whether Kerr Finn seems to have done that excellently. But even though they did it excellently, it still took them time to start utilizing the potential that was there. Yeah, uh, we probably were slow, like, I mean, you look back, Mike is probably working in the uh, in that industry since two thousand and five, two thousand and six, mm. and really we didn't start utilizing them uh, until Roch came in. So really using them around the two thousand twelve, two thousand thirteen mark, um, and I suppose that's back to Mike's personality. Is he's not he's not forceful. He would never he'd never in come to club and say, look at this is what we need to be doing. If we're not doing this, we're wasting our time. And if you don't listen to me, I'm off. Mm. Do you know, Mike came, the service was there. If we wanted to use it, good and well. And like Mike just stayed doing what he was always doing. And um, I suppose another lad might have come in bold and said, look, what you need to use this. If not, I'm wasting my time here. Good luck. Yes. Do you know? So, but it's all relative as in like, you could have used him sooner, but he still led the way in so much of the physical conditioning stuff. Yeah, and I think that the, probably came the fact that with so many lads in with inter county panels that uh, and around that time it had started uh, to get big around the, the mid noughties through the Armas and Tyrones. It had started to get big, so then you had you had Fitzy and Damien Burke and Sicey and Mikey coming back to the panel, so it helped that we had five or six lads in an inter-county panel, you know, it, instead other clubs might have only had one. Yes. Do you know, where, and we were lucky enough that the lads we had in there were big good physical. Good club men as well. Yeah, yeah big physical, uh, athletic and yeah, good club men. Okay, so we'll switch gears a little bit before we go into any tactics or anything like that. So, you love football, obviously. How... It's very, it's fashionable, particularly in the GA. You see in the soccer now, the World Cup's on at the minute, and a team can be defensive and they won't get much grief or hassle over it, very little, little. But you see it's fashionable in the GA to come down awful heavy or awful negative and critical on certain teams. But you tend to stay quite positive about the game, in spite of everything. Um, you're human, certain things annoy you about the game, but how do you stay positive when it's so f uh, fashionable to be negative and complain? Especially on Twitter and the, these different avenues for voicing the problems rather than what's good about the game. Uh, yeah, I suppose the Irish in general are probably negative enough. Um, you know, we're we're probably a negative nation. How <clears throat> I suppose is there is there any right way or one way to play the game? Does not. Uh, every people, and that's what. That's what makes it so interesting is everyone has a different opinion on it and a different way of playing it. We were looking for a fin where uh, the way we, we played the game, and I won't say it's the way we wanted to play the game because it's easy to say that. Uh, but I think, yeah, I think if we needed to go defensive, we'd call it out too and say, like, there was no point in us playing nice attacking and nice brand of football if we were getting bet, you know? Yeah. Um, we played nice football, but we were winning. And I think if we had to do it another way, we would have, you have to find a way to win. So uh, that's why I'd be open that 
okay, we were lucky in Curfin, we could play football a certain way because we had the players, we had uh, management uh, that was able to coach it that way uh, and we had the players that, to understand it. But I can see the point of view from if you take over a team and they, especially a club team, whatever about an intercounty team, club team, you're going to have a lack of quality. You're going to have to go a certain way to be competitive. Um, and then what I'd say to that is that you probably need to, as a coach, coach the game two or three different ways so that if you need to be defensive one day, yeah, okay, you're playing a better side, you're going to be better. There's no point in going toe to toe with them. Uh, but equally, if you're playing a team that's lesser than that, then you need to be able to say, okay, as today, we're just going to be a bit more advanced and, and, mm. and go for it a bit more. Uh, I think that's, that's probably a better way to, to try and play the game than playing one way or the other. How so? When I I've been coaching eleven years, and the highlight probably two highlights probably the semi final we drew with Mitchells, and the intermediate title, and they were big big days for both clubs, huge days. Um. So, how do you view success differently from the average club when that is success for most clubs winning an intermediate title for many clubs in Galway I mean, it was huge success yeah. it's a massive achievement uh, getting to a county semi-final is a massive achievement for the vast majority of clubs in Mayo bar maybe three or four who expect to get there every year uh, when you are expected to win at least Galway every year how is success viewed differently or do you ever think about it that way? Uh, I, I think uh, from my point of view uh the fact that I played a variety of sports uh, helped. So I would have heard with a local club there in Ceylon, mm. and it's a football dominant area. Uh, Hurling plays second fiddle. So like you're playing underage, but you're playing in C competitions. You're playing in, uh, like, what success when I played with Ceylon is that if you won an under 14 C or an under 16 C, and then like what's, what, what was a massive achievement was to be playing under 14B mm. or uh, under 16B, do you know? So that grounded you then uh, from the point of view that, like, Curve Finn was on a different level, that it's not always reality, that you can't always uh, play in A and be winning A titles all the time. So that the the balance of playing with Ceylon, I think, grounded me. And then you had a lot of lads that would have heard with Ceylon then in that, that you would have had your, like... Joe Kenny, in my time, Joe Kenny, Kieran Comer, Shane Monnan, Donald Kane, Jason Killing, uh, Tomas Coslo. You know, so that grounded us a bit that we, it just gave you an appreciation of what you could achieve with Curra Finn. Yeah. And if we didn't achieve it with Curra Finn, then I think that, that, was, that was a poor reflection on us because you realised what reality was and the potential you have in another dressing room. Mm. So it, we'd be foolish. Here you are going hurling with Cylon, playing junior A, junior B, and fighting relegation maybe, and fighting for your life to survive junior A. Yes. And then you have this potential that if you just get your act together, you're going to win a senior A county title. Mm. So it just helped that the, the appreciation and understanding that. And like you said, there, to stay relative, like is it hard to do that it, across the panel? Is it hard to put things into context and appreciate them while they're happening? I suppose at senior level with Curl Finn, you have such a mix where like we would have been part of a successful underage team where we won minor A and under 21A. And that was huge for us because we had lost Fela finals, we had lost an under 14 uh, championship, we lost an under 16 championship. So we weren't the most successful group and we would have had maybe five or six players in that senior panel but then you would have had Fitzy's team who would have five or six in that panel as well that were never beaten in underage mm. and then you had uh, Mike Farrer's team or or uh, Ronan Stee's team as well that won fail and counter titles and so so you had a good mix so you would you myself personally would appreciate then that it might have been easier for some and not for others so if a young guy came into the panel and he might have had the same underage success as what others would have. I suppose you'd appreciate that or you'd, you'd realise that and you'd try and encourage him and talk to him that now he's in a senior panel, that this is the expectation. And regardless of what he won or didn't win at underage, 
there was an expectation or uh, it was all it was all what we did in senior now was what was important and not what we achieved at underage. Yeah. If that if that makes sense, do you know? Totally so yeah. what I'm trying to say is I suppose it was easier for Fitzy and these guys that had been so successful in underage to want to come into senior and be successful. You know the lads that weren't successful, but they had to they had to be brought along to say, well, it's now what we win at, at senior level that okay, you might have been competitive at underage against Salt Hill, but now at senior level we're Yeah. Where I suppose you could say top dogs. Yeah, and like, when did you realize that you had uh, a talent for the game in terms of like if you were coming up through underage? When did you realize okay, I could actually be pretty good at this? Was it was it pointed out to you? Did you get a certain coach who uh, put belief into you, or what? When did you start to realize okay, I could actually go and play for Kerfin senior team? Um. In Curfin, you'd, it wouldn't be, you'd never be told, uh, but uh, I suppose a good indication would always be... Maybe uh, not told, but like where you encourage them. Well, a good indication in Curfin is if you're training with the under-10s and you were moved up to the under-12 group. <laughs> uh, that was a good indication that, that uh, you, you might have been a little too strong for the group you were in. Yeah. Do you know, and again, that goes back to, I'm sure, there's other clubs where you'd say, oh, he was moved from an under-10 to under-12. You might have clubs that under-8s, under-10s and under-12s probably train together. Yeah, really, yeah. Do you know? So in Curfin, yeah, we'd have your... It's, and it's different now again. This, it starts in Curfin probably from under-5 or under-4 or whatever it is. But that time in Curfin, yeah, if you got moved up or if you were 7 or 8 in those under-10 competitions around the county and you got a phone call to say, look, we're playing... Back in Carrisran tomorrow in an under ten competition, will you, will you come along? You knew then that okay, you, you were you were probably one of the better guys in your own age group. And again, going back to it, that wouldn't be a big thing in another club that you'd be playing under ten at, at seven or eight or whatever. But in Curfin, if you played two or three years above your age group, you, you knew you had some bit of a talent. So you didn't really members. think about it much of the time. You just played. Yeah, I didn't think about it too much. You didn't think about it too much. But that was an indication, I suppose, if if, if you were playing number 14 final and you were the 12-year-old and you were in, you were playing corner forward and you might have been keeping a 13 or 14-year-old off the team, mm. you could self-identify that you must have been okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we'll switch gears a little bit. So if you're looking at young players now, whether they're at Curfin or any club, or they're even going into a development panel or into a St. Coleman, they're jealous, and they're 14, 15, 16. The way the game is now is different to where it was 20 years ago. Uh, where do you think is still their main focus? What should they be focusing on above all else? Now, this is before, like, your your Mayo Minor, Galway Minor, chance to go and play in Co Park. This is earlier than that. What even a parent or even a coach uh, who's involved with younger players of that age group what should they be focusing on the most and what should they not do what do you see certain coaches and certain uh, players focus on now and you're like what this that's just doesn't matter what are you wasting time on that for probably probably positivity remain positive you know uh again going back to as a nation we're probably very negative so it's very easy for a 14 year old maybe to come home after losing a match and dad is in the car and worse now moms are in the car getting out. <laughs> uh, yeah. you know that uh, such a lad didn't play well and such a lad was playing and he shouldn't have been playing and this lad should have been taken off or put on or whatever yes. I think as a young kid you could start listening to that and start blaming everyone else for why you're not playing but I think and I know it's an unusual thing to probably try and teach a kid to stay positive. Um, you probably have to teach the parents to be more positive, but definitely be positive. Okay, bar a few, you might, you're might. you not going to start every day. You're not going to play well every day. You're not going to win every day. But if you can stay turning up and stay doing what the coaches are telling you, because with the courses now and stuff, coaches should be a bit more advanced than what they were in our day. It's still a bit. It's still difficult though to find a positive coach, isn't it? Yeah, I suppose it's hard to find a guy that's in it for the right reasons. We were looking in Curraghfin 
like we had guys in it for the right reasons. Uh, Frank Morris been number one, I suppose. Uh, Gary Sice's dad was another good lad. Uh, in my time, and the, how would you know? What, what would they have focused on with training younger kids? I was well with Frank. It was all about skill and learning the basics and kicking left foot, kicking right foot, and I have this conversation all the time. But you do, yeah. Uh, like Frank, there was days I was lucky enough. I grew up next door to the pitch, so I missed very few trainings. But there was times there might be something on, and you turn up, and there might be only three lads training for whatever reason. Uh, wouldn't happen that often, but obviously you'd. But you'd be thinking to yourself, lovely, because it might be raining. It's not going to go ahead. We'll I'll go home and go back watching TV. <laughs> but Frank had run the same session. Yeah. Obviously, Baird not playing the game, but it's still doing the skills. You're catching kick. Kicking off left, kicking off right, punt pass, um, all that type of stuff. And you still think that that today should be the main focus of your session? Yeah, for for young kids, definitely. Yeah, yeah. and even at adult level, like uh, you went to a couple of the Curfin senior sessions, yeah. and a lot of, especially early on, bef- before the session starts or at the start, that all very basic, yeah. in twos, catch, kick, left foot, right foot, block, pick up, all that type of stuff. Just get very good at the basics. Mm-hmm. Um and then then Jimmy Sice Gary's dad was added a bit more steel to you. He was a bit more old school, so like he couldn't say it out loud, but he liked he liked the when you go into play a tune and there was a bit of <laughs> a bit yeah, of a row yeah. and stuff. And he liked when you got stuck in and okay maybe in the dressing room he'd have to say to you or oh, you can't behave that certain way. But behind the scenes he might give you a wink and a nod to say yeah. You know, don't back down. Yes. So he added that steel to what Frank Morris was doing with regards to skills coaching and making good footballers out of us. And then Frank, I used to always think, if you were playing a game, training a game, like Frank had always put restrictions on it if you were good. So uh, maybe as a right footed player, you could only kick with your left foot. And then also, you know, as a kid, you're going down the line and there's a lad on you and you're panicking because you want to kick it with the right foot but you can't get the kick away because your man is, is stopping it and eventually you turn and twist and three or four times and it should be a free against you and you eventually you kick it away Frank can stop bring it back and tell you to turn inside and either hand pass it to a guy that's beside you or kick it or kick off with your weak side your left foot you know it's, so it's the decision making is cool yeah isn't? yeah yeah instead of letting it run like you'd often see it under it I let it run and play on He'll mm. he'll he'll pull you back, and he'll he'll tell you what the best decision was at that time, to make. So that's it. Obviously worked because that's something that has stuck with me thirty years later. Yes, do you know. So it does obviously benefit to it. And uh, is it is it difficult to coach, the the basics? They they might be basic, but is it difficult to coach them properly? And is it, is it difficult to coach decision making properly? Do you think? I think my own opinion on it is that the, what I found is the best coaches are probably teachers mm. um, because they're used to dealing with kids all the time and they're used to teaching kids. So they probably have that bit more patience, patience and the ability to teach something. I, I, I find it hard, okay, I can identify something and identify something I want someone to do and mm. I tell them what they should do. Mm. But it, is that enough? Can it be coached better, I suppose? Um, well, so, something that helped me a lot was when I started, do you know, do you know neuroscience, and that's yeah. very popular in coaching nowadays, you know, how to change habits and things yeah. like that. Well, well, they explained it as in your brain, if you have a certain habit, it's like, a, say, a field with rushes in it. And you, know, you walk a path and you wear down this path in the field. That's the habit that's formed, but it might be a bad habit, like yeah. kicking the ball away when you're under pressure, you know, trying a hard pass or a hard shot. It might be a bad habit, and you don't even think it's instinct to kick the ball away, or it's instinct to take a wild shot. And if you're trying to get them to move to a better habit, that better habit might be another path in that field, but it's not as nearly as worn as the first one. So the longer you, and the more you encourage them. With it, no matter what type of habit this is, whether eating habits or training habits in the gym, or but I but I found it especially helpful with changing football habits is you have to be very patient with them while they're switching from one path to the other, because first of all you might be ninety ten the bad habit to the good habit, then over time you're fifty fifty. 
bad habits, good habits. And then the more drills you do, the more, and eventually you're 90% taking the right option and 10% the bad option. So no matter how bad the habit is, even if it's like binge eating or you know, kind of smoking or something like that, you can actually change. People come off even things like heroin and being an alcoholic by simply doing that, finding out what the triggers are and being patient enough to with yourself or with the person you're coaching that you're changing the habit from one to the other, you know? Yeah. Because a lot of the time, I, I found I was very, very guilty of this as a personal trainer and as a GA coach. You just wouldn't be patient enough. You tell them what to do. You tell them this is the right thing to do, but they're not even thinking about it. They're just instinctively doing the thing that's frustrating or the thing that's not maybe best for the team. And you have to be so, so patient, especially with kids. Yeah, and that's why like, you'd have to appreciate when you look back uh, with what Frank Morris did. Like, he'd give the time to every kid and to every guy and, and try and coach every guy the same way. But to have that patience of, like, you're playing a game, of stopping the game, pulling him back, making you do the right decision time after time after time, whereas the easy option for him was uh, play on it, do you know? Or go fucking. Yeah, do you know? Uh he took that time which as you said is patience and like sure it, it, you see the benefits out of it 30 years on then that we have so many good guys that are able to make so many good decisions under pressure time. yeah under pressure yeah because the more the, again back to that bit in your science i'm sure you heard um, andrew huberman and people yes. like that so like he explained that, that the more stress you're under and the higher the cortisol in your blood the more likely you are to go to the bad habit you know, so when you're in a real high stress situation in a county final or county semi final, you're more likely to go to what you're used to. So that's why it has to be so ingrained through the training, and you have to have so much patience when you're trying to train yeah. people. You know, but you see in the gym when you're personally training people when their technique is horrible starting off. You know, and they might do one rep out of ten that's decent, and then over time five or six reps out of 10 to go decent you know, that's quite a good example of it and it's no different with a habit then when you're playing the game yeah so that's that's very that's very informative because essentially coaching is it's a, it's at such a position now i think in all sports where people are far more open to new ideas than they used to be uh, for training methods and things like that yeah and there's more stuff available then as well uh kind of with the courses and stuff you can find online and uh you can continuously get better whereas probably years ago you know you couldn't really uh a lot of the coaches mm -hmm. were just guys that turned up in wellingtons and mm -hmm. like, they served a purpose too but they didn't know what they didn't know you yes. know they just they knew what they knew Yes, and I suppose nowadays there's so much available to any person between social media, online courses, all that type of mm -hmm. stuff. That the if you really want to, there's no end to it. So if you really want to be a good coach, the the facilities are there for you to to better yourself all the time, aren't they? Mm, they are, but sometimes it can be overwhelmed with too information, too much information, yeah. which is what happened to me numerous times. I'd be trying to implement too many different new training drills or tactics or things at once and it just causes confusion so again the patience you just have to pick one thing and accept okay i can't work at everything at once just be patient enough to spend session after session at this until it goes yeah. right keep the main thing the main thing yeah which is difficult yeah so again when you started we did it with nutrition but when you started lifting weights was there a specific reason for you lifting weights or how how old were you and what type of exercises programs how much like progress did you make also i've seen you lift weights hundreds of times now again since uh, i remember yourself and fitzy uh, using my gym for mike's programs before you'd ever won a all Ireland. and i don't think i've ever seen you do a session that wasn't full body you're never doing like a chest day or an arm day or a back day or a leg day. It's always full body. So what type of program did you start off on? Was it always like that or what? Again, it goes back to the being introduced to an intercounter panel. First year again in and I, you're up in the gym and you're with lads like Mike Meehan and Damien Burke and these guys and they're, they're lifting heavy and then you're with them and you're embarrassed because you might have to take 30 or 40 kg off the bar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so 
and then the bias is I suppose if you're not good at something or you feel like you're not good at something you don't want to do it so I didn't like it but I realised after my my first year in county football like it was a requirement I needed it I needed to get better at it to give myself a, a better chance like I had to get stronger I had to get fitter I had to eat better um, basically be the best I could be so at the end of the year I spoke with s &C coach who was a Neil O'Toole at the time and we, the year had ended and I figured to myself well maybe this is the time for me now to make gains and, and get away from some of them big hitters that I wouldn't be as embarrassed I could train on my own and he done up a very simple program for me and it, it funny enough it was a, a full body from what I remember what type of exercises were on it? Bench press, chin ups, rear foot elevated split squat was on it. Funny enough, that was horrible. Um, yeah, yeah. Still is horrible. Landmine and stuff like that. There was a few bits on, maybe six to eight exercises. Yes. So Fitzy had just left the intercounty panel and we had just started. We worked the same shift, even though he was in Athlone, I was in Claremorris. We were working the same hours. So we had started training together. So I just started looking at him after getting this bone bit piece of paper few exercises uh would we do it yeah so we did it on all our rest days so we met up maybe three or four times a week and did this program for whatever length of time months it seemed i suppose before the inter county and did you up. did you bulk up did you gain much weight or did your weight stay the same when you got leaner or what happened to your physique and, uh, i bulked up definitely i uh, got stronger and got better at, at each exercise how uh, many kgs would you have gained uh i would say i would I would say I was up around 80 kg, I think, when I went in with Galway the second time, so 2012, and I was probably lingering around 74, 73, 74 kg before that, I would I would say. Okay, so, uh, so about a stone of muscle. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you look, you could identify it on me then as well, like, you know, people would say it, that you're getting big. And from there then, I suppose the, the bias changed where I wasn't good in the gym. Now I was good and competent in the gym and I wanted more and... I wasn't afraid to be tested, so when we're back in with Galway and we tested for chin ups and all that kind of stuff. I had the work put in, so I knew I was going to be good, and I wanted to be tested, and I wanted to test myself against the better lads in as well. So, uh, and then from there, just and when you gain it. when you gained that say stone of muscle that time, would you would your fitness have suffered in terms of like uh, your bleep test or your fitness test, or would it have got better? Uh, I would think it got better because I would have been aware, thinking back, I would have been aware that my fitness had to get better to play into county, so it would have got better. So despite you gained muscle, you didn't lose any flexibility and you got fitter. And got faster. And faster. Faster. So you got, fa yeah, everything you, was improving at the one time because it was new to you. Yeah, and I, I suppose that was the measure for me with getting faster was that people would say to you that, like, my 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 straight line speed had improved, you know, and you could identify it when we were playing. Mm. Well, I think what people underestimate about the GEA, and I explain this an awful lot as as well as players who come to me trying to get faster, is it's not a max out sprint; it's a repeated sprint sport. So you might have someone who's rapid quick over twenty yards, but if you ask him to do twenty of them, he's gassed yeah. after about ten or twelve. And then you have a fellow who might not be as quick, but he's able to keep repeating that sprint all day long without getting any slower you know which yeah. is what your Dublins and your Mayos and Kerry's can do now they can just repeat that sprint at the same speed over and over and over again so sometimes it's not about absolute speed it's about being able to repeat the sprint without getting tired yeah so you were getting faster you were getting stronger and you were getting heavier a lot of people kind of think that they don't happen at the same time okay if I'm getting heavier and I'm bulking up I'm going to get slower or if I'm working on my fitness, I'm going to lose a bit of muscle and I won't be you know, as strong. But I think that's a false perception. Uh, how did you found that to be? Yeah, the, it all tied in, came looking back. I suppose a lot a lot changed over the course of a few months. So could you pinpoint it to any one thing? But like nutrition improved drastically. Now my, my S&C had improved drastically so together they just i suppose produced a better athlete mm. it's hard to it's hard to explain it mm. uh but what i my in my change of habits which were your normal habits go 
going in into the gym an odd time and not doing the right stuff we'd say just picking and choosing not exercise here and there mm. having your cereal in the morning and your toast and your your, your carvery lunch and all that that changed so together the nutrition and the gym worked for me because it got me stronger it got me fitter it got me faster and that all tied in together so it wasn't a case of well i improved nutrition first and then i moved on to the gym then i moved on to speed and fitness or whatever it all just tied in together um, mm. and it definitely worked for me mm. okay so we have so what you mentioned just four exercises there was simplicity the essence of your training always because yeah. there is a tendency to overcomplicate an awful lot of strength conditioning and fitness in general, you know. Um, so what you kept it very simple to gain. Yeah, so early days, very simple and, and just progressive, progressive overload. overload can really that uh, try and add more reps or add a small bit of weight to the bar each time, you know, and that's how you knew you were getting stronger. But very simple bench press chin-ups and then found my way on the bench press where for me uh, a narrower grip was easier and made it made me lift more weight because I was out to weight so so you just have to find your own way too with the guys there's no one way to bench or a right way to bench obviously there's, there's there can be a safer way than other ways mm. but play around with your feet play around with your, grips. your hand grips and that kind of stuff and find what's right for you and what feels right for you. And that's what I did. Were you taught technique? No, I would have been by Neil O'Toole. I would have explained that I found it hard to get to get stronger or to get better on it. And he he would have said, well, look, move in your hands a bit and, and move back your feet. A bit like the power lifter kind of wrap your feet in under you and, and stuff. And that yeah. worked. And I got stronger and got better on the bench. Okay. But then, so again... To bring Mike into it again, so he was obviously, he still is a bit of a pioneer when it comes to the standards and strength conditioning. And you, when Kerr Finn were playing and they were playing, you know, the very stylish football and things like that, they were, there was numerous players on the panel that were getting stronger year to year on your bench press, hex bar, deadlift, chin up type testing. Yeah. They were also either maintaining or increasing their beep test yeah and they were also staying lean they weren't gaining body fat which is a i found as a coach the, the biggest problem for an awful lot of players they're just gaining too much body fat yeah so there was three things going on there which essentially is the job of your strength and condition coach make people stronger make and lift heavier weight more muscle make them be very very fit so they're able to do that repeated sprint over and over and make sure they stay lean so they're not carrying too much body fat how was that juggled in terms with your your pitch sessions how did sometimes in a management team there's conflicting interests i want to work on this but you only have a certain number of hours that you're going to have the lads each week how did he balance that so that you're not the whole time working on fitness and neglecting skills I'd, I'd say just a, a, an all, a good management team where everyone stayed their lane, I suppose, and uh, we were regularly tested in Curra Finn. In am, am I right in saying that he was given free reign to control that side of it for you? Yeah, he'd be... My, my, my understanding from, from the outside looking in towards the management team was that Mike, Mike would have dictated everything that happened from the point of view of how hard... A session was going to be when were we going to be tested what we did what runs were done in the session uh, all that type of stuff so then obviously management would probably design the session but to be designed around mike mm. so mike had jeff what you would think mike mike dictated a lot of what was going to happen mm. and then i i suppose back to my point around a good management team they stayed their lane so they put awful trust and faith in Mike, yes, and I mean, sure, it 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 worked because yeah. every year we got at each stage of the year we seem to be in peak condition. Like when we got to All Ireland's physical strength and fitness never let us down. You know, we got brought extra time a couple of times in games, bigger pitches, all that type of stuff. We weren't found wanting, you mm. know. Uh, but it it's it's rare. It's it's very rare that 
and management will trust the strength conditioning coach that much. Now it's also rare that there's you know there's it's like uh, guards, teachers, nurses, doctors. There's good ones and bad ones. Mike was a good strength and conditioning coach, but it is and there's plenty of bad strength and conditioning coaches or average ones. It was it's rare that they trusted him that much because a, a lot of GA coaches will want to train the fuck out of a team or run them into the ground type scenario, um, and they weren't willing to do that because he said it wasn't the best way. Yeah, so I think what helped what helps Mike is that he he comes from a footballing background, so he played the game and played it at a very high level. So I suppose from a management point of view, they know that he understands the game, that it's just not the S and C side of things, that he knows how the game is played and what's required to play it. So that helps. And then he probably would have he probably would I'm sure there was arguments around, well, do we need to train them of course, yeah. Harder, do you know, they look, they look unfit, do you know, but Mike might say, well, no, they don't need to train harder, they might need less or whatever. Mm-hmm. And management, management would, would have enough respect for Mike, I think, to go, well, if that's what Mike says, uh, then that's what we'll do, mm-hmm. do you know. And I'm sure, I'm sure there was once or twice where he, he, he had to drive the message home, mm-hmm. but when you're successful... And what you're doing is working, then I suppose it's that bit easier to, to convince other lads in the management team that it's the right thing to do. Yeah. But so where in the you know, where in the sports science element because like myself and yourself we'll be given this job that Mike had with teams, you know, and that's you know, you want to work with teams and work as a strength conditioning coach and try and help players be as good as they can be. Where is the uh, position for running them so hard that they're feel sick or really testing their limits till they're at their absolute max. How often do you need to do that? Um, in ter- in the gym, how ho- how hard do you need to train? Because like you didn't get that extra stone of muscle without training hard. You know you didn't get fit. Kirkin didn't get fit without training hard. So how often uh, do you need to do that or? Because some some coaches they get trapped in early. I need to run them all year round, yeah. but that doesn't work either. I I still think pre season you have to train hard because also it it mean, it it does build a mental capacity then as well that and like, team spirit. As yeah, well. like we've had we've had a lot of success in Corrifin. In recent times, we've used a lot of modern the modern science, if you if you want to call it, through Mike. Uh, but before that we had success as well and we did it the, the old way like we, we, yes. we trained hard and I remember when Roch when Roch came in like those nights there that we had no ball during pre-season and we have an AstroTurf in Curfin and we just trained in the AstroTurf and it was 50 it was 150s and I think 30 seconds on 30 seconds off mm. for 10 rounds and we ended up covering like four and a half thousand meter, metres a night and like that that felt like hell on earth but was that the hardest session you ever did I think so yeah I think so and uh, like that had us in good shape didn't come the summer but you'd be like me or Kevin Lynch or uh, maybe Kieran Cunningham or Keelan Crow and Gary Moore you would enjoy that type of really really hard training yeah you wouldn't want to avoid it you'd be like okay I have to get this done yeah yeah you would want it and I think even like and but sometimes in the sports science era, you can get lost and you can never do sessions like that and you're missing out. Yeah, well, I see that firm Gambata on, on Twitter said, like, are we under-training individuals now? Of course, I, I think so. I've yeah. met a lot of that. So we're... And look, uh, again, the GA players, some of them like softness. So if you give them an out that, uh, like, of RPE and... We're looking for this session just to be a six. Should they love that? Mm. Uh, do you know? They don't want it to be hard. No, no. Well, certain ones. Certain yeah. ones. But there is like at least a third of your panel that want to train so hard they can barely talk afterwards. And that type of session is important. And I don't think there's enough people talking about driving lads as hard as you can. Even though it's an obvious part of the game, you're not going to be successful without it. Yeah. Uh, and then... Like you have individuals that, as you said, like that 
you named a few of you that love that type of training and it's like going into the trenches and yeah. you feel great after it, you feel fit and, and ready for the for the year. But there's other guys, like I used, there was times in Currafin there that, be it a gym session or like, everything wasn't perfect in Currafin all the time. I think people from the outside looking in things, everything was perfect. Well, we had problems and we had trouble getting lads, some lads training and some lads wanted to train harder than others and some lads didn't want to train at all. And yeah. there was times you'd turn up training, there'd be lads missing for whatever reason, be it, be it in with a county panel, be it uh, injured or gone off doing something else. Or, and you, you might only have sh- few numbers at training, but I always used to use that in my own head to get, if a lad wasn't there, this is my opportunity to get ahead of him now, mm. to, to to get the 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 fitness train or whatever it was in the bank, mm. and I was a step ahead of him. The same way with in the gym, an organized session, but some lads mightn't turn up, and you might there be a good few missing or whatever it may be. Instead of whinging and complaining about who wasn't there, that was my opportunity to get ahead of someone that wasn't there. Mm. That's the way I looked on it okay. every time. So we get into the weeds a little bit because I think this is interesting and I think plenty of people listening to this will be coaching or involved in the team. So if you're trying to get a team fit and you're trying to like go for your your money sessions, like brutally hard, uh, the, the sessions that every team needs to get done, what type of runs are you doing? with them um now you've done all sorts i'm sure but what what type of runs would you say okay i always felt great if i did these type of runs for four to six weeks or whatever i did what i liked myself was the interval so the like 15 seconds on 15 seconds off and probably going for 60 meters and mm. then build up that over time so so how many sprints would you do so over to be you'd be going at that rate you'd be going at three quarter pace so it's it's mass running really I think they call it but yeah that's what I I enjoyed I I felt that's when I was getting fitter because we'd say for say it was sixty meters for the first week or two you might struggle to get to sixty meters and it was harder mm. and next thing the following week you can see yourself it's a lot easier you're hitting that line of maybe thirteen seconds yeah and then the next week you progress out to sixty five meters progress out to seventy meters and now you're hitting the seventy meters of fifteen seconds okay. whereas a week earlier you're only hitting 60 and you're struggling okay. so that's the type of trend i liked and you did so you did a sprint 15 seconds then 15 seconds rest yeah well it wouldn't be a sprint to be three quarter pass okay so and, then, and then would you uh how many of them in a row would you do before getting say a minute break probably eight between eight and twelve and then maybe take a two to three minute break and then do another block after yeah, yeah. and how many blocks was the most used probably two to two to three blocks in will be enough. And is there turn in that sprint or is it straight line? It's straight line, straight a straight line because it, it's easy enough to map out sixty if you're on a pitch. Yeah. To map out sixty meters. But then again the 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 one fifties that I spoke about with Roch, that that for me was effective as well. So what was that? That was your thirty seconds on, thirty seconds off. We did it in an Astro, so it was out fifty back and back out again yes so there was turning in that yes so again no harm uh that was something that worked uh, and maybe someone will come along and say that that doesn't work of course they will well no matter what you do someone's going to come along and say that's the wrong way so from my experience this way is better of playing they are the two types uh of sessions that you felt great after yeah yeah and yeah i've i've done all of those with teams, you know, different ones at different times. The ones with the turn, the 150, they sound very, very similar to what I did. The 15 seconds on, 15 seconds off block of running. And that what I found, especially uh, all the teams that I've trained will have uh, memories of the 200s, I like to call them. So it's not exactly 200 meters, it's probably a bit short. So you go the full length of the pitch uh, along the line, and then you cut across and finish at the goal or just past the goal. Yeah. So it's about 200 meters, maybe 150 meters. And you would do 30 seconds flat out and 90 seconds break. You get that done in about 30 seconds and yeah. you'd have a 90 second break. So the rest to sprint ratio would be about three to one or four to one. But that's actually quite similar. You, you, you're saying 15 seconds on and 15 seconds off, but you're, the, you have to factor in that the three minute break comes at the end. Yeah. So the rest to sprint is actually quite similar in that. But they do reckon for uh, your 
your basketball, rugby, soccer, Gaelic, those intervals where if you can keep it to three to one or four to one rather than continuous running like yeah. mar like a marathon or something, you will actually get far fitter and you'll be able to accelerate with far easier because it's there you're you're training acceleration while you're fatigued. Yeah. Yeah. So right, so that's that's interesting. So just you brought up the 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 Kerfin management team structure. So just to go into that a small bit. I know you're not gonna to want to give away any secrets or anything, but like so plenty of it is common sense and not secrets at all. Yeah. So you have I remember one time um there's a few games I went to see a lot of Kerfin, an awful lot of Kerfin, right from the first All Ireland all the way through. So there's a few games that stood out to me particularly. So one of them was the where you played with fourteen men for nearly the whole game. Uh, against the Kildare team yeah, Moorfield, yeah. in the All-Ireland semi-final and you were injured that day injured, yeah. so you played against Moorfield but it was incredible because it was basically you were playing with a handicap the whole game Yeah, I think you were sent off the first minute or two uh, straight from throwing I think Martin Ferry yeah, ball but, went down to the corner and he got right. so, so it's nearly like a training drill essentially yeah. it's nearly like okay we're going to give this team an, an extra man. player and we'll see can you can you still win it and you did. But I remember asking you about it after the game because of uh, just the decision making under that type of pressure was unbelievable the whole way through the game. I'd recommend any coach to watch it. Uh, but one of the things you said to me afterwards was about Dave Morris. So I was like, what did you say at halftime? What did you do? Or what did you Because you, ha you had the two young wing backs, Dylan Wall and, and they were only in their first season wing back, maybe. Yeah, yeah. May maybe their second, but I think it was their first. And you said, uh, well, I just went in and I said, look, lads, just take your break and wait for drills. Drills is going to come in and just listen to what he says and do it and we'll be fine. So if you have someone coming in under that much pressure to give a team talk, are they coming in banging tables, shouting and roaring? What type of, because a lot of teams, well, every single team is going to come under serious pressure uh, in their next season in a championship game. What should the the emphasis be if they are under that pressure? Should the manager be looking like he's falling apart? Obviously not, and shouting and roaring and banging tables and making no, or should he be given some sort of, like he was given obviously excellent advice in a really pressurized situation. How can any other coach aspire to do something like that? Uh, with, uh, like, with regards, uh, I suppose anyone that doesn't know drills, it's uh, Dave Morris. But Davy has like he's in my opinion on a different level, and it's it's easy, it's easier as a coach I think before the game to plan out this is the way we want to play and this is what's going to happen this is what we want to do and all the rest of it, it looks great and then in game when it's not working how do you change it Yeah, do you know uh, it's like the Mike Tyson quote everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face yeah do you know and. How do we come away from that plan? Then obviously, or whatever it may be, but Dave was very good in game. So I, I know myself, and probably yourself, when you're watching a game, there's so much going on, it's hard to. So I naturally gravitate to watch defenders. Yeah. Because I'm a defender, so I'm gravitating towards how the, how's the full back going, and that takes so much out of you mentally that like when you're watching that. It's hard to see what's happening on kickouts. It's hard to see what's happening out midfield. It's hard to see what's happening inside or shaping the forwards. Hard to watch it all and then decide, oh, wait, this is the best thing to do. Do you know? So, but Davy has that talent where, especially in game, where he can identify so many things at one time and then have the, the know all to change it or advise lads how to change it and what to do. It is, it is, it is actually just unbelievable. Do you know? So, I mean, how how is he doing that? Obviously, he has all his experiences that are unique to him and his personality. But is there anything that others he's doing that others could aspire to do in terms of like? Is there certain markers he's watching in terms of stats or certain videos or what type of feedback is he look taking in in game to try and make a good decision like that? I would think it's 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 almost a natural ability that he has, uh, and not not everyone. Not everyone can do it. Do you know, there's, there's times, Kevin, when you just put your team on the pitch and you prepare them as best you can and then you're you're hoping for the best, really. Mm. But he, he just has that ability to, 
to be able to to change it around to identify so much he just he just has a, an exceptional football brain that for me he's on a different level and how is he communicating it is he communicating this with i have some like graphs here so like what i used to always do was like uh four phases to the game where you'd have like uh, attack defense right so you'd have your basic attacking shape basic defensive shape because they'd be changing yeah and then you'd have your kick out shape so your shape when you're pressing a kick out and your shape when you're trying to win a kick out is he trying to communicate in game with graphs or with just his voice uh, and what what's his demeanor like? Is he roaring and shouting, or is he just trying to separate uh, backs and forwards? What's it? What's he? Dave. Dave is. Um, Dave usually would be in the stands and would send down the message. So he'd be mic'd up and would send down the message. And we used to back in the day have a runner. I don't know if you're allowed a runner anymore. So yeah, that that used to be Mike Homer or Joe Kenny. And from an obviously from a higher point and in the stand, he wasn't. He could he could stand back and watch the game and see more things and and give clearer messages. So then the runner would go in and give that message to whoever required the message. So it'd all be, it'd all be very systematic, nice and calm, and the message would come in. And then every once in a while, uh, Davy is human, and Davy will march down the steps at the stand, <laughs> <laughs> and you can hear him coming. And if it's a fucking that you need. You might need an advice on how to do something or where to go or where to be, but there's times when you just need to get fucked. A kick and uh, yeah. he'll come out and when he's on the sideline, that's when you know you're in bother. <laughs> <laughs> so then at half time, is he thick or is he is he again, is he using certain graphs or stats or what's he trying to do at half time? Uh he's very controlled. It's I, I unless unless very seldom he'd use like a graph or a tactics board. He might, he might to get a message over the line. He might need it, but it, it's it, he delivers a message and it's very it's it's simple and there's no. But again, back to the point where if a guy argues it or there's too much talking going on in the dressing room, then he'll mm. he'll he'll his voice levels raise mm. and he can he can lose it a bit and that's when you know then just to tighten up and sit down and say nothing <laughs> yeah yeah well it's an art though isn't it because it's public speaking and i'm i'm an I'm a english teacher before i was a personal trainer like i i firmly believe the limits of your language is the limits of your words you know if you can communicate better you just have so many advantages so like and communicating isn't just using big words or fancy words or fancy phrases it's removing all the fluff and just getting straight to the point so if he, if you're able to communicate clearly uh, as a manager or as a coach it's just a huge advantage do you know so like it and it's it's very very rare a lot of i've talked to so many people about ga over the years and some of them have fantastic football brains and they, they spot things very, very well. Things that I've used then in the next training session or the next match, they struggle to communicate it yeah. to addressing them. No, uh, no, Davey was, was able to communicate and then I depend on who he was talking to, back to whether that need that whatever way that message needed to be delivered, uh, be it to the group or to the individual, he'll deliver it in the way it needs to be delivered. Mm. You know, um, and a lot like the the Kerfin management team, like you, you had big personalities there, like you said, Joe Kenny, uh, Mike, uh, Dave, and Kevin O'Brien. Yeah, maybe like, Dave Hanley is physio. Yeah, they're, they're big personalities, but no matter how big their personality is or how um, intelligent they are or qualified they are for their role, they still have to communicate things clearly. Which is very difficult. Even even sometimes you see like in any sport, soccer, Gaelic or rugby, there's a huge problem with coaches, managers, organizations, they don't listen to each other. Despite having good people around, they don't nothing's getting through to anyone. Yes. Yeah. There's a lot of communication. So that's difficult to get right for any management setup. Yeah, the everyone was mic'd up and the 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 main message I would say would, would have came from Dave, but then obviously if you had an opinion you give it mm. but I, I and I was mic'd up a couple of times because when you're injured you might be doing water mm. but it wouldn't be a constant battle like the radio would be quiet there wouldn't be everyone chipping in a bit if you saw something 
you see it, it goes upstairs, then it's it's dissected and, and sent back down or whatever. There was no, it wasn't total panic on the airwaves, everyone rode and then, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. it was in a controlled manner. If someone, because that rubs off on the players too, doesn't it? Yeah, and if, if a message came from a player to be sent back up, mm. you know, uh, and again dissected or whatever. But yeah, back to that Moorfield game, like in Curfin, we would have been very good at anal- analysing the opposition, putting together a game plan for that opposition and then implementing it on the day. Mm. So I suppose then next thing and you were you were like you were guided on how to play a lot of the time so it was straightforward um, and it worked an awful lot of times so then you go out and you have a, a picture of how you're going to play against Morphic this is how we're going to play them this is how we're going to beat them and all of a sudden you're down to 14 men yeah. and you're thinking Jesus well uh, now two things so number one we're lucky enough we have players that can adapt uh, and make it to half time and then obviously the message will change from the Aber management and then the guys who can go out and implement what they've been asked a second time. So we we had that ability in Corfin to play one way but also adapt. Mm. Well I, I actually have a, a good story. Another time I watched Corfin play, which was uh, it really opened my eyes to the level you were at, was one time you were playing Tune in Salt Hill or in um, Tune Stadium. And you were against a gale force wind in the first half. Do you remember that when yeah. Bernie kicked the free? And uh, I was at, I was down at the goal, and I think it was Mike uh, Comer that was wired up. I was down at the goal. I was walking in, and Bernie just goes, "Can I have a ball to Mike?" He shouted over Mike. Must have been twenty, thirty yards away, and Mike goes, "Ball." And the ball flew in from the sideline within seconds. Yeah. You know, so you had like Bernie to the guy who was wired up. The guy who was wired up didn't even have to shout. He shouted over the line. The ball was in rapid. Yeah. That level of attention to detail was just incredible, really. Yeah, and behind the scenes, like that would have been, I won't say worked on, but it worked on to a certain degree where everyone had a role, match day, what was required, what ifs, all that type of stuff. So even management probably would have discussed and I wouldn't have been part of management obviously so I'm only guessing here but I'd imagine the, the, the clientele that were involved in the management going into that more field it would have been probably discussed well what if so what if we lose a man or what if we lose a midfielder or what if yeah do you know what if they have a sending off yeah what do we do what are we going to do do you know all that would have been trashed out long before the game even started mm. so then everyone would have a role then so like Mike would know where to get a ball Instead of him having to run back around to the sand, look into the subs, where the footballs, where the footballs. Exactly, which know. I've been in that situation yeah, a lot yeah, of yeah, times, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, which is like, it's the most normal thing in the world. Yeah. But the attention to detail that Kerr Finn went into, uh, people forget about, they see the goal, you know, the, the, the goal, like, you know, the, like, it's like Barcelona-esque where it's touch, touch, touch and the ball's in the net and they nearly think it happens uh, instinctively yeah, without yeah, it being yeah. planned or without okay he's a weak link let's target him or this is what we should do with our kick out to open up a pocket or something like that they forget about the attention to detail that goes into playing that style of football yeah and even our session like some of the, the scores we got in all Ireland finals it was straight out of the, the training ground really it was stuff that we would have worked hard on mm. I know the, the kick out to Carl Silk where the wing back tucked in and Carl Silk just took off running down the line and Bernie hit him on the run. Mm. That was all worked on. Different things like that. Like the goals we got would have been uh, stuff that we were working on. Almost like team. almost like um, an NFL team. Yeah. You know, like you said, everyone had a job. It's like Bill Belichick's thing, do your job. Do you know, the, 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 ba- the way it worked for Belichick from what I've read is like he clearly defined a role for absolutely everyone in the whole setup. Uh, whether player or management team or whatever and you just had to do that you didn't yeah. have to focus on anyone else's thing you just had to do that yeah and it, it stops then it stops people like everyone has a job then so when you arrive at train everyone has a job or something to do that they're not just standing around talking and mm. next thing something happens and there's a big panic mm. uh, like everyone was in control of some part of the session do you know mm. so it meant even the lesser lads that didn't have as much to offer as others they still had a job and they were expected to do that job to the best of their ability. Mm. Do you know? So there was a guy on water and bibs and stuff like that was his job and he was expected to do it properly. 
and there's a there's also like a frustration sometimes when jobs are spilling over so someone's not doing their job properly and someone else has to cover for him and it's if interfering with him doing stats or him you know laying out the jerseys yeah. but someone else isn't doing their job properly or you have that you don't trust the people around you so you're constantly checking up on them and you're interfering with them and annoying them and there's friction because of it yeah so the clearly defined roles thing is crucial yeah and it's a small thing like so if something did happen on the pitch and someone looked for something Kevin O'Brien knew who was responsible for that mm. Kevin O'Brien just turned and directed whoever was and then it helped that everyone had a role and everyone knew the role and, and everyone had to stay their lane somewhat that we'd say the Montbellu game and even the Tune game down to the years where the two kind of finals where uh, we were losing draw, yeah. yeah, and we got a draw like there was no panic from the sideline you know there was it, our secretary or our treasurer didn't become the manager telling yeah. Bernie Power to do something <laughs> and uh, yeah. but that's the most common thing in the world yeah do you know or no one came down from the stand to say look jeez we need to get put Greg Higgins find Greg Higgins and put him in full forward yeah, do you yeah, know yeah. it was it was just I suppose reassuring the players tell the way we had trained for this mm. so just reassure them that this is what we're doing mm. so then it might be just keep wide so that'll be the message coming into the line mm. stay wide stay wide stay wide stay yeah. moving whatever be simple messages nothing nothing out of the ordinary mm. that you knew you had to stay wide but there's so many like there's so many moving parts to that because you have like you have star players on the pitch um some of them playing county some not but like plenty with star potential and then you have like a brilliant club set up the way the club is run and then you have an excellent management team there's a lot of big personalities like Roy Keane always says characters the Man United are yeah. missing characters now the team he played with has ca- he had big characters but everyone was still willing to put their ego aside and just play their part uh, however big or small inside that little structure yeah and and then no matter how big the ego or personality was yeah and then you had to you had to respect you had to respect the ego of others then that the way we were doing things so maybe Sicey could get away with a little bit more than what I could get away with you know or saying or doing or whatever yes. so the, so lads were given a little leeway to be themselves to it saying it wasn't a case that we were military that everyone had to act and behave the one way yeah there was expectations of uh, behaviours and standards but like I mean there was you were still allowed to be yourself so yeah, yeah. like positive communication but every once in a while Sicey just wanted to fuck someone <laughs> you know so uh, and usually it, it it came in the direction of myself and Fitzy yeah. so but you I take it a bit easier than Fitzy would Fitzy bite back like yeah. that wasn't in our uh, if you're if you're talking about standards and behaviours that wasn't supposed to be our standard but it was the way Sicey was you, you took it on the chin and it was it was not that it but was there's allowed. no there's no team there's no team successful or not without that yeah so uh, it's, it's, you were it's still when allowed it gets, when it gets corrosive to the spirit of the team I suppose yeah uh, and then other, like we'd say some players were allowed to do maybe take a shot on so Sicey could take a shot on yes, that I, yes. I the expectation that I wouldn't be allowed to take a shot on <laughs> uh, Steely could deliver a ball that someone else wasn't allowed uh, yes well when me as a coach um, in the teams I've, I've I've put that where this fella's not allowed to shoot yeah especially with his bad foot whatever about his good foot it doesn't go down well yeah it might sound like common sense here me and you sitting down talking but actually getting that player to say no you're not allowed to take a wild swing outside the scoring zone outside your arc it's, it's hard to implement. It yeah. It's back to those habits and the patience and things like that, isn't it? And even if a player did something that, uh, like we had a group that were very smart, you, they didn't need to be pointed out too much stuff to them. But like if you did something wrong, then I won't say you're ridiculed in public, but it came mm. up the next night on the analysis that mm. you didn't stay your lane. This was the outcome. In front of everyone. Yeah. 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 Do you know, and I think there's a lot of like pandering these days, especially to young footballers, where you're nearly not allowed to say anything yeah. negative or critical at all, or everything should be said behind closed doors, but you're losing the accountability of it. If you've agreed that the best way to win this game is by X, Y, and Z, 
and they decide to take it on themselves to try your wild passes or take their wild shots and they, they expect nearly to be pulled on it in private without anyone else yeah. knowing. That doesn't work though. No. If there hasn't the if the accountability of the group isn't there, it's it's they yeah. they take that bit of a pulling aside all day long. And then uh, obviously uh, the way they word it will be different different from one player to the other because yeah you just had to be I suppose they had to be skilled that they didn't want an argument in mm. public over something so it was skilled that it was put in a way that. Uh, yeah, so well, I I met I met Jack O'Connor before, and he, he came down to Gary Moore and did a session. But I asked him that question. You know, would you? It's like it's a common question. I'm sure anyone who's coaching here could relate to it. Uh, would you have stopped certain players from kicking the ball? And he said, absolutely. He said he went into All Ireland finals, and he didn't name the player, but he said he, I said to certain players, this was back five six years ago before he was back in with Kerry, and I said, you do not kick the ball today. And he'd name them in front of everyone the day of yeah. the match, you know. Some I think some coaches are afraid to do that, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. But it's necessary. Yeah, no, we wouldn't. I don't. I in 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 Curfin, the expectations is that you'd know your limitations. So it probably wouldn't have to be said. But I think you'd have to understand. Uh, going back again, Sice, he could try an, an outside of the left foot pass from mm. one wing to the other. There was no point to be trying that. No, you, know? you might. In a game, you might be five or six points up and like to try it. Yes. But, you no, know, you stay your lane. Mm. That was the expectation. But just, just while you're on Sicey there, uh, this is a, this is just bringing him up, but bringing up something that was characteristic of a lot of the Curfin players. So, you're playing, um, it's not Schlock Neil, Kilku. And Sicey is probably the highest score ever in Curfin, maybe? It probably, yeah. Probably. Uh, I, I wouldn't say it's tracked, but... Uh, yes. I'd imagine he's up there. So he makes this unbelievable block with seconds on the clock. You remember it, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, was it extra time? It was extra time, I think. Yeah. Extra time. Yeah. How do you get that much uh, desire and hunger and you know, those things that everyone loves to talk about, whether it's the All Blacks or it's your... Argentina now at the minute or it's yeah. how do you get that into a team that's already been so successful he's going for his third all Ireland in a row and he's literally hungrier than teams that have never won. yeah and I think Sicey is just a different animal I think he's he's self-motivated where yeah Sicey is all about the, the group and wants the group to be successful and all that but a lot of it, uh, a lot of it would be down to that he wants to be successful, so he needs the group, you know. So he'd be driven, self motivated to win that three in a row. That's he'd want that for himself. Yes. You know, and he'd be just aware that he'd need he'd need others to help him to do that. But mm. uh, he'd be self motivated that, like the reason he would get that block, would be, uh, and I'm sure he wouldn't mind me saying this, but it would be down to for what he wanted for himself. Yeah. He wanted to win that all Ireland more than anyone you mm. know and that's that's the way he is he just has that competitive age but it is it. it is like your Ronaldo there's no harm in being wanting to break records and wanting to be the best as long as the team is profiting from that uh, yeah um, and with Sicey, uh I think it helps is he's he's likeable uh, he's liked and adored by the group because of his personality yes. you know so people respect him for that then as well you know, uh, which makes it easier. So no one is going to turn around and say that, come here, you're selfish or whatever, because he is a good team player. He's very friendly within the group. And yes. He's good with the younger guys and all the rest of it. He's likable. So mm. like in any sport, Kev, if you're likable, uh, be it a player or a coach or a manager, if you're likable, it's half the battle. And what is likable? What? How, how would you define that? It's, how, is that? Is that even tangible? Uh, it's hard to measure, but... Like, I mean, yeah, for, for, like, for a player maybe who feels like they're trying to drive their team on to the next level and they feel like, okay, maybe it's coming out wrong and I'm just fucking lads. How would they come on the right side of it? Yeah, to that point then, it's, it's probably how you deliver the message then on, like, if you want a young lad to be better, you probably have to encourage him and bring him along and help him and, and, and try and teach him how to do something right or what's better then 
barking at him, barking at him and fucking him. And in fairness, Sicey had that ability, he'd help you. But then, once the ball was thrown in, like, you'd see him talking to a young wing back uh, or a young cornerback and advising him, hand around and all that type of stuff. But then you'd be playing neighbor speed and the young lad would be the first lad that would be dumped. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, but, uh, but again, uh, to re-emphasize the point, that was an example of Sicey, but like you saw a lot of examples of you doing very similar stuff, Fitzy, you know, Martin Farher, uh, doing those really selfless stuff uh, and really hard graft and things at crucial times in big games. It it, it was a spirit uh, of the of that team. Yeah, and then probably when you mention our vintage, it probably came from the fact that where we we had struggles. The, the three or four lads you mentioned there are there since 2002. Fitzy's probably there since, whatever, 99, 98. So we had barren spells, and we didn't always have huge success. Yes, we had success, but not to the levels we had later on in our careers. So it probably meant more to us, and we probably appreciated it that bit more. And we probably knew that the good days weren't going to last forever. So to maximise when you were there, mm. like, make sure... Because it's so hard... It's so hard to get to a county final. It's so hard to get back to a county final. It's so hard to get to a provincial final. It's so hard to get back to one. It's so hard to get to an all Ireland final. Mm. Um, and you can't take it for granted. You don't know when you'll be back there again. Mm. You know, and in club football, time moves on quick that uh, if you don't win something for two or three years, all of a sudden you go from being 30 and maybe nice peak age for club football to being... 33, 34, pick up an injury yeah. and uh, things are slowing down for you. So mm. uh, while you're there, you have to maximise it. Yeah, so just before we change and start to wrap up a little bit, on your, so you're on about getting back to an All-Ireland. I know this, the, another game that you mentioned a lot or talked about a lot was that Vincent's game where you finally broke through. And I've watched that four or five times. Uh, it's a brilliant game for any coach to watch and study. It's 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 excellent because both teams, I think, set up to play very positive and to go at each other. Uh, neither team, There wasn't a contrast in styles, really. I think both teams set up to play attacking, definitely from watching the video. That's what I feel watching anyway. Both teams set up to kick the ball as well. But there's this ferocious tackle count. I think I, I counted over, I did the stats on it, but you had over 100 tackles. There's a spell, I'm pretty sure, in the 37th minute to the ter to the two and a half minute spell where it's it's ferocious. Both teams, every single time you get the ball, there's nearly two, three lads swarming around you. So you have these star players like you had on your team and they have your Jim McConnellys and Massey Quinns and things like that. But even to be competitive against those teams, you have to tackle that hard first. Is that something you agree with? Uh, yeah, it, it, it was a, something that we put big emphasis on uh, through 2012, 13, 14. Tackle count. So that was the big thing is uh, tackle, how many tackles. And they made a big deal of it. There was like, all the tackles were tracked. So then at the end of the game, the in statistics were put up on how many tackles each player made. So... There was a bit of competition around it then, who wanted to put in, and usually Liam Silk was high in the tackle count, um, or Greg Higgins. And then as forwards, then you wanted to, well, like there's a competitive nature, back to Sicey, there's a competitive nature in him, so he wants to be on the top of the group, be it a fitness test, or a strength test, or skills test. So then if there's a tackle count, he wants to be up near the top. So okay. straight away then, he's going to put in a shift and try and put in tackles. And there will be, there'll be hassle, like, the first year I was injured, I was given the job of counting the tackle and, and like you, you come in at half time and like you get nothing but grief because you'd say, Right, okay, this will yeah, Sicey, and, uh, <laughs> no, and you could be up by five or six points, and yeah. Sicey might be after kicking three points. And uh, or Kieran Comer was another guy that like he was midfield and playing the best football he had in a good few years. and uh, was one of our be better performers and you were coming in and saying he'd say how many tackles and he'd say you've none mm. but like he owned the ball mm. and he'd be saying oh, for fuck's sake what about such and such yes, I yes. tackled that time yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but that doesn't count and half time was taken over with lads arguing about how many tackles <laughs> they made yeah. so that kind of carried on and even then like against the lesser teams where you might own the ball there'd, there'd be um, 
to be an emphasis put on tackle king. So then whoever put in the most tackles would get a reward at the end. Yeah, yeah. So it's something small, but it was something that, like, lads, there was a competitive nature. It's incentives. Nature. It's incentives, yeah. yeah. There was a competitive nature in the group, and mm. uh, everyone wanted to be on top of it. And it, that that definitely was the emphasis going into that year and going into that fencing game was, like, if, um, if we can, and I suppose the, what we would have learned from previous teams is the, the team that works the hardest and tackles the most. Well, it's interesting in the context of that Vincent's game because, like I said, you might say, oh, a defensive team would have more tackles than an attacking team. It might be an assumption. Yeah. But I have found that sometimes when we scored the most, uh, we, we were like 20 minutes gone, 35 tackles, something mad, yeah. you know? The tax count is huge, even though you're 2-5 to a point up or you're flying in the start of the game. And there's maybe if you're focusing so much on the tackle, you might all oh, become a defensive team, but it's not the case. And both teams that day like attacked, kicked great scores, put lovely team moves together, but the tax counts were off the charts on both uh, yeah. sides. And I think it was around the time then that the attitude of forwards was changing where back in the day defenders defended and attackers attacked. Mm. And once the attack broke down, that well, it was over to the defenders to defend then, you know, mm. but it changed around that the game became 15 attackers and 15 defenders. Yeah. So if you lost the ball, you had to... And I, I, a lot of that probably came from Pep uh, and his Barcelona where that he apparently had that rule or that... Five-second five rule. Five-second rule. Seven where, second yeah, where you, if you lost it, you had five seconds with a back or whatever. So that, that's what was happening uh, with teams then, and especially it happened with us. Mm. And it lifts the intensity of every game you play way higher. You know, but, but our Castle Bar and Ban Tuber started doing it before Mayo and they just leapfrogged everyone's it, teams were a decade catching up. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that that game say personally again after talking about uh, the team an awful lot. Personally, that game you have a lot of doubts, a lot of maybe worries going into it. You're you're nervous about it. That's it it might not feel like because you're a part of a successful team, you have any doubts or you have any worries. Um as well as that you have your injuries. You're used for a decade now playing with injuries or playing with yeah. knocks and niggles. Some players you can't get them out yeah. of bed with, with with the smallest of niggles. You know and what I, I mean? Remember, I remember thinking um, I was carrying a couple of knocks going into that game, but I remember in the warm up we used to do the Nordic hamstrings. Yes. Nordic falls and just do three or four of them in the warm up. And I remember like getting a pinch in my hamstring. And I said, I'm after fucking. <laughs> I'll have to do it anyway. I thought I said I want to kill my cover because it was in the normal. I said for fuck's sake and just I suppose in your own head like you just felt everything was a niggle uh, going into a big game even though like it went on it was fine and I had a sore knee going into the game it went on it was fine um, but there was that group now albeit it had changed it, there was a few new faces Liam Silk uh, Liam Silk Liam Burke Martin Farrer uh all good young lads but the bulk of the team the, the guys I mentioned Gary Laney then Joe Kenny Shane Monning Ken Murphy Alan Burke all these guys uh, we had been to all Ireland semi-finals before mm. and it goes back to what I had said earlier that just because you do everything right doesn't mean you're going to get over them. yeah or doesn't mean it's going to work out for you you know because Vincent's obviously doing everything right as well mm. and then it's a long way back if you lose that game then you're back all the way square back to the square one again. Back, Snakes and ladders yeah, again. Yeah. Back playing tune in a dogfight again. Um, and no guarantees. So we had got to All-Ireland semi-finals and we got close and we'd lost. And this was going to be our biggest test really. This is it. With all the work we had done under under Roch, uh, this was the test. And uh, thank God we, we passed the test. But it was the first time too that we used a lot of video analysis of opposition and we went away for a weekend in Sligo and done a lot of video, went out on the pitch, put it into practice, back in, video, all that type of stuff. And like everything that we had looked at and worked on and done, like you could see it unraveling. So one thing was like the, their keeper's kick out. He had a kick out where he took maybe two steps back to his right and a little dink pass. The, the wing back pulled out wide, he took two or three steps back and the midfielder committed that space. Very simple. Mm. 
So like Sicey then was instructed to keep an eye on this and when it happened to cheat, mm. don't go because the wing back was Brendan Egan, good footballer if you let him off, he'd hurt you in the but gamble and fuck me, that's where the kick out went. When the keeper did this, that's exactly where the keeper and Sicey turned over and I think we got a score out of it. So straight away you could see, oh hold on, we like this is all stuff that we had worked on. Yeah, and, and the confidence grows. Yeah, confidence grows then so and even I was marking Mossy Quinn and I had been given analysis on Mossy Quinn. This is this is what's and so when Jerry McConley picked up the ball, he looked for him. And there was little triggers that Mossy ran one way, but the ball was always going to go the other way. Mm. And he was going to check back. So just be conscious as a cornerback. You think Mossy's making a hard run to his left, you're going to go hard, but he's always going to double back. So you have to be conscious of that. And it happened the first two or three times. And again, I got confidence from that. And it had worked so well for them previously that they probably couldn't change it or were slow to change it. Mm. And But even with that, you were still nervous going into a lot of these big games. Ah, uh, you would be, yeah. You would be. Um, but you'd and be I nervous, have... Kevin. You'd be nervous going into any game, to be honest. You would. You would. Agreed. But say... And sometimes the smaller games are the ones with the most pressure because they're like your banana skin type yeah. things. But how would you deal with the nerves and the doubts and things like that? I know you... Um, I, I think that the way I like to deal with it was like I was after uh, oh, you know, the opinion you kind of... You couldn't be smiling going into it. You had to have the headphones on, hood up, keep yourself to yourself. If lads were laughing and joking, they weren't tuned in. And then... Uh, as time went on, I kind of realised that, like, days like this doesn't come around forever. Getting the bus up, going into Johnson House's group and having a meal and preparing for an all Ireland final and all decked out and getting the blue light into Crow Park and going in the back of Crow Park and all this stuff was surreal. So you realise this isn't going to be, last forever and it might be the last time you're here. So you just, you actually take, uh, take down the hood, take out the headphones and just uh, chatting to the lads around you. And usually the young lads are down the back and the older guys were up the front. So you're, you're chatting to Fitzy and Joe Canny and Drills and Shane Manor or Kevin Murphy, whatever it is. And you just, that's part of the day too. Like you, mm. and, uh, you basically have to crack going into it. Yeah, you're focused, but you do actually try and enjoy, enjoy it. it. Yeah. 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 And and it helps because then you're a bit more, like even on the pitch before you go out, you might then have a little giggle or about something that you're just, you're not wound up. Mm. Uh, and it definitely helps yeah so the you just the more you got used to it the less nerves there were or were they always there they were always there always there you just dealt with them better mm. uh, and I used to find in game dealing with nerves was get on the ball early mm. take a deep breath and, and make your first lung bursting run and after that then you were fine yeah, yeah. you know it was it was it was game on then after that. But the longer you waited to get into the game or make that run or support the play, the the, the more nervous you, you are. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, the more likely it was to yeah, affect yeah, you. Yeah. So the, the quicker you could tear in in my in my experience, in my opinion, the quicker you could tear into the game the better. And did you write notes, uh, pen and paper before games or what Yeah, um, we we would have worked with uh, Jennifer Kilroy. I suppose she she be would have been a facilitator. But say personally, did you have your own notebook you were writing notes on or things like that? Or? I we would have had sessions. So a lot of them sessions were optional, and we would have done that. Uh, I suppose a type of journaling, if you wanted mm. to call it. But it was like a performance zone. So where are you in the performance zone? And then I just take notes of where we were, where I was, what I needed to do, and the bottom line was that the. She used to have like a pizza. There was six slices, and in them slices was S and C, uh, hydration, sleep, performance, whatever it was. And then like shade off where you were. So we from six weeks out, you might start this, or from three weeks out, mm. where are you on this? And you shade in where you are. And then three nights before the game, where are you? And everything was fully shaded because you knew, mm. and it, it it just was a good tracker where. Okay, just now that I'm saying this, my sleep is is poor. I'm only shading. Mm. I'm being honest here. I'm only shading halfway. That mm. needs to improve. Uh, my S and C is good, so I, I just need to maintain that. I don't need to improve it. My sleep needs to improve. My hydration is only shaded partially. I need to improve in that, and that give you a direction of where you need to be. And then, mm. but if you're going in with a hamstring 
you've got the worst of injuries, the hamstring, the, the cruciate ligament, the broken leg. You're going in to plenty of games where it's not a fully completed pie chart or you're not 100%. How do you not let those things interfere with uh, what you can do? How do you... So probably experience, Kev, where early days uh, I would have thought everything needed to be perfect. Which is what a lot of players fall into. Going back to hood up, headphones in, fixed mindset that I'm here to do a job or whatever, and then you don't really enjoy it. So back to, yeah, I, 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 I needed to eat at certain times and be have certain meals and take on certain amount of water. I needed to foam roll, I needed to do this, I needed to stretch mm. out, I needed to be in the dressing room an hour beforehand to get mm. X, Y, Z done. And then I realised, well, it's not everything is not going to be perfect. Mm. So I go to a game some days and not foam roll. Mm. I need foam roller at home. Mm. Because, well, it just changed the mindset of, okay, that's available, it helps, but I'm not... Going to fall apart without... Yeah, I'm not going to fall apart without... Uh, same way with the stretch or the warm up or whatever it may be, I'd, I'd go without certain things every once in a while just to, yeah, I'm not going to fall apart without it. Mm. You know, and it helps that, yeah, routine is important, but when you turn up to a game that your routine is off, mm. then you're in bother. Mm. So if you create, an, in my opinion, if you create an environment where you're not. You trap yourself in that yeah, routine. Or yeah, anything. correct. So if you're not trapped in that routine, that if something is thrown, a bit like mm. the Morphe game, you're down a man. Mm. Okay, what else? Let's. So, but you're. What? You, you weren't a big fan of warm ups, were you? Uh, no. <laughs> I just, I prefer, I like to, I like, would have liked to sit in the dressing room and prepare myself mentally more so than physically. Right. Um, so, I, like, I hated warm ups. <laughs> so I just wanted to play the yeah. no, I can see the value in warm ups, obviously. And well, it's like the Pirlo quote that a lot of people know was uh, Did you hear it before? No. It's like uh, warm ups are just uh, masturbation for strength and conditioning purposes, <laughs> which they are a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, they're unnecessary and they're over the top, and you just want to be kicking ball and doing a few stretches. Yeah. And it, like, even if you're looking at it there, if you, you'd often wonder with the the World Cup, watching the World Cup, all Ireland semi finals and finals was very seldom anyone gets injured. Mm. And very seldom anyone that's injured is leading into it. So you get lads that miss league quarterfinals and semi they're out injured or whatever. But like how you never see someone really missing an all Ireland semi final or final. So much of his mental. You just wonder, yeah, <laughs> World Cup like Well it's it's even at the even at the club level, you know, you don't have to go to the World Cup. Like you're, you haven't a clean bill of health all year. Next thing is championship and everyone's fit. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's just funny. I don't yeah. know that. So a a small bit of a personal question. You don't have to answer it if you don't want. But you were on a star studded Curfin team. You know, so many players have played county. So many players. But you were picked as captain, and you, know, you were cornerback. You weren't the highest scorer. You weren't the most skillful. You weren't catching balls in midfield. Why do you think that was? Um, without asking uh, Kevin uh, O'Brien yeah I suppose you'd have to ask Obi Dovin that well a, a lot of a lot of players you know um, like uh, Kieran Cunningham and Gary Moore or Kevin Lynch in in Mayo Gills like like they of course they want to be captain I'm sure yeah. you want to be captain as well in, in ways it's not the be all and end all but it's nice so if you were to say to a young player from any club, who he, he'd like to be captain next year, what would you tell him? What, why do you think you were picked uh, in that context? Pro probably that the fact that I, I stayed uh, I stayed committed and stayed turning up uh, when sometimes it was easier to give up. Um, I came from a level where, back to the introduction of Intercounty, I came from a level where I was doing everything, it's unfair to say wrong, but I was doing a lot of stuff wrong Hmm. To change in my ways and doing everything supposedly right. So you were coachable. Yeah, do you know? Uh, I I I I changed my ways to be better, uh, and I suppose be better for Cora Finn. So maybe management and and Kevin O'Brien identified that that I just stayed turning up. Like even those times we lost all our semi finals. I remember we lost to Croaks and Limerick, and then like about 
10 days later we had to go down to Milltown in a league game and obviously you're going to get abused by not turning up in that all Ireland semi-final and like we were bet by 7 or 8 points so, so the, the Milltown lads have plenty of stuff to say <laughs> but uh, yeah. like and fits it the same way some lads just once the all Ireland, all Ireland semi-finals over they didn't want to see football for yeah. weeks or months which is understandable yeah where we and I think if I'm honest, that probably sickened a lot of clubs too, that these boys, gee, there's no keeping them down, that they just keep turning up uh, mm. and keep coming back. And I suppose that was that was my attitude and I imagine maybe it rubbed off on the, the team or rubbed off on some of the players and, and OB probably identified that. And It was it, the grit more than... Yeah, I think so. If, and like, we didn't always, we weren't always successful. Uh, we didn't always do it the easy way. But we stayed, we stayed turning up and we lost in a county semi-final another time to Kinneraird and then a week later we had to play Tune in a league game. And like we had the beer 15 to play it and I think we got a draw out mm. of it. Now Tune, I think I don't know, did a draw suit them or did they need to win or whatever, but it just showed uh, the mentality of the group and it, the, the same boys turned up here. Gary Delaney was there, Joe Canney. Uh, Dave Morris and Madonnawan. So it's because they could depend on you. You were reliable. Yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That um, it's it's that it simple. It's that simple, really. It's not saying anything magical or doing anything special on the ball. It's 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 being yeah. reliable and committed. Re- yeah, yeah, reliable and committed, probably. Yeah, and that I suppose if if everyone was like that, we'd Things always have a smoother. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. that that was probably my my greatest actually was that I was reliable and committed. committed yeah. Okay, so you're currently doing the Satanza. You got a scholarship in it. Yeah. What it's very popular with past players now, isn't it? The Satanta course in general. Yeah. Scholarship or not, what do you like about it, or what are you enjoying? Well, I suppose the 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 with regards to the reason it's probably popular with a lot of past players or whatever is the GPA do fund a lot of. So it's it the funding is a huge help. Obviously, if you have to pay for something, it's harder. And then, for me, previous coaches would have done Satanta. So then, obviously, you're you're pushed towards that. Then when you so Neil O'Toole was a huge influence on me for S and C. Who is Neil O'Toole? He he's um he's yeah. from Galway originally, Galway City, and more rugby background but he's big into JA the last few years he's been involved in St James's mm. but he was the S&C coach with Adam Holland when Adam Holland was goal manager and it was him that kind of he coached me along the way from an inter-county point of view there was a guy there before him he was involved in Leinster rugby so he was in, in under Tomas O'Flaherty and I, I think the two coaching styles were different like he the, the Leinster rugby guy had more a bullish way and Back to your point of getting frustrated when someone like I wasn't Mr. Ruby. This is I'm a 26 year old, my first year into a county. I mm. don't know how to lift properly, probably. Mm. Uh, but he didn't have the patience, probably, to coach me right. Then you had Neil O'Toole who had, who had the patience to take you aside and coach you and give you his time outside of the group setting as well. You mm. know, he worked in the, the order and stuff. So there was ever anything you needed, come up, come see me. You know, so he did the programs for me, uh, and like he would have been a—he's a good friend of mine now, and we keep in touch. And he—he mm. he was a big advocate for Satanta. That's where he would have learned his trade. So okay. through him, then I just. Don't and know. what are you enjoying about that course? Well, to be honest, it's hard to enjoy a masters. <laughs> Love, sorry. Ah, yeah, it's 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 a lot of academia, which which is tough, but and and what's the end goal, Kevin? The end goal is I don't know. Like is that an area you want to get involved in? Is to have that qualification and look to go working with county teams? For me, probably not. Uh, but it'd be nice to bring back to potentially my own club at some stage that expertise mm. or bring it back to. I've I've two young kids and a third on the way. So mm. uh, if if I had someone when I was yeah, half back then. yeah yeah hopefully if I was if I was had someone at when I was fourteen or fifty or sixteen that guided me the right way so hopefully if I have a bit of knowledge when they get older I can guide them the right way and send yes. them to the right people yes. um, that might give them the best opportunity and they might not play football or they might not play any sport mm. but if they are at least if I can guide them the right way uh, it's it's something that I would like to be able to do yes yes okay well 
we can start wrapping up there. So just uh, on, is there any uh, books, podcasts, documentaries? I know you're quite into them, aren't you? Uh, uh, I asked this question to everyone. I've, um, I, and I'm going to ask it to everyone on the podcast. Is there anything that particularly inspired you? I know that all three have had a huge impact on me. Is there anything that, you, is there anyone you like listening to? You like reading an autobiography? Uh, you'd recommend? Probably the autobiographies, the, the sport ones would have been, I don't have as much time to read now as I would have, but I think the autobiographies are good. I think Paul O'Connell had a good one. Andrew Agassi had a good one. Yeah. Um, for me, the Johnny Wilkinson has a couple of books, but he one in particular, I think it was Tackling Life. Yeah. And that one I found very good because at the time I didn't I didn't know what where the level was at and how far you could go. Mm. And when you read this book, you said, Jeez, whoa. Like I mean he he was obsessive about getting better. Yes. And and you can see that from the book. And he ended up like doing too much and getting injured a lot of times because he'd done he was so doing, obsessed. Yeah, so obsessed. So that that was one that helped me realise that okay, if you are going to be successful, that you probably need to be a bit obsessive. You're mm. not going to be successful by just turning up. Mm. You have to do more. Uh, and how do you do more? You're probably outside the train. It's what you do is as important as in train. It's going to the right guys, looking for advice, going to your nutritionist, going to an S&C coach, going to a, a mind coach. No stone, no stone left unturned. No uh, stone left unturned. And I didn't read Paul Kilgannon's book yet, uh, Be the Best You Could Be in Sport. Mm. But by the sound of that book, that's exactly what you should aspire to be, is be the best you can be in sport. And you can only be the best you can be by going looking for this information mm. yourself. Uh, You're not going to unlock your full potential without getting certain clues and information from other people yeah and it's 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 going to cost you money uh yeah. it's going to cut like i mean you can't expect you can't be a club player and expect to get better and expect the club to pay for it uh or expect the club to have all these good guys or the best guys available so you're going to have to go and fish them out yourself yeah which it, which i something i've always been inspired by in the gym is that, like i get a lot of um players from a, f a few different counties now and a load of different clubs coming to me and for they want one on one you know one of them wanted to win an intermediate with Dunmore he went and won that yeah. this year uh, a fella from Kilconny wants to get on the Galway panel he managed to do that after a year with me uh, and it's 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 a brilliant thing to see when someone's going off their own bat on their own initiative to get one on one pay extra whatever it is to go and find out what they need because no matter how good a strength conditioning coach is if he's working with 25 lads he's only going to be able to give you a second yeah, it's hard to give back yeah to the individual but and then in my own opinion then as well is that if you're doing the same that everyone else is doing yes then you're still only going to be as good as what like if they're better than you they're going to progress at the same rate as you so that the gap isn't going to close but if you mm. can do something different that's what I found that if, if I went and did something different and trained a different way, rightly or wrongly, now you have to identify quick enough whether it's improving you or, or not. Mm. But it might improve you. You have to try and improve yourself to close that gap between you and the, the person that maybe you're competing with mm. for a place in that club team. Mm. But if you are competing against a guy that's slightly better than you and you're both trained the same way, and then three, he's going to still stay a step ahead. Yes. So I'd be of the opinion you've got to go and go do something different. Okay, so those are the books. Any documentaries you've loved? Documentaries. Or that have inspired you? Uh, funny enough, the Lance Armstrong documentary. Yeah, yeah. Is one that I really liked. The book is brilliant. Um, yeah. Documentary. Uh, usually Anton sport, sport related. More, I suppose, my, my I'd have to shift my thought process now, Kev, around where... Everything I wanted to watch and read was from a player point of view. Mm. Uh, now that I'm shifting from player towards coach, I'll have to shift and start reading and watching more mm. coach oriented documentaries and books and stuff. Yeah. So a lot of the stuff I would have watched, and obviously same as everyone else, that the last dance was excellent, all that type yeah. of stuff. If you're starting coaching, I think Nick Saban is a brilliant one to rabbit hole to go down. If you went into ten or twenty hours of his stuff, he's a podcast. No, Nick Saban is the, the head of Alabama, head coach of okay. Alabama, and they're the most successful dynasty of all time in college football. Okay. And he's brilliant. He worked 
for Bill Belichick and then went to college football. Yes. So you read up some of is he the highest paid? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's 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 brilliant. He's the highest brilliant. paid S and C. No, he's a head coach. Or head coach in yeah. college football history. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you're starting coaching or if you're in coaching for anyone listening, I think that would be a brilliant outside sport. You know, not too many people listening to this be coaching football, American football. Yeah, they'd be mostly GA, but that would be a brilliant one. Yeah, and I think down to the years, Curfin have taken a lot from other sports. So, mm. like we've taken bits from be it American football, rugby, and in particular the last wild soccer. Mm. Okay, that's probably the perfect place to wrap up. Thanks a million for talking to me. I know you can. Uh, we're well able the two of us to keep going on and on, but I think there's loads of practical information there, and I think uh, plenty of coaches will get loads out of that, and players just as much. So, Cheers, Kev. Yeah, thanks, thank for you. Me.